And um, tonight, um, for the people overseas, we're going to have a lecture. Should you play tug of war with your dog? And um, if so, how we're going to play with our pooch? And if not, um, what game should we play? And for the people here, welcome uh, to another lecture. Um, so for uh, people on Facebook, um, like usual, you can leave me any comments uh, below, any questions uh, below. Um, I have a moderator that will look at your questions and um, ask them um, to me. Um, unfortunately, Facebook can have a two to five minute delay, so um, don't worry, I will address every question that is posted on Facebook. Um, just give me a couple of uh, moments. Uh, for the people on Facebook, again, give me a thumbs up or a like and let me know if the audio and the video is good. And if so, we will get started. Audio is good, video is good. Okay, excellent. So, one of the things that um, we uh, should ask ourselves is, um, you know, how should we uh, play with our dogs and should we play tug of war with the dogs? And the answer is a really big maybe, yeah? Um, it really depends on the genetics of the dog and the uh, antecedents um, because um, tug of war can be a incredible good motivator that can assist us in building a relationship with our dogs or it can actually destroy it. And it's really depending on you know, what the innate behaviors or innate responses are to the game of tug of war and in kind of what mind state the dog is. So in general, um, when you know, I work with the, my average German Shepherd, um, then I would say tug of war is a good idea because the dog um, has innate behaviors of chasing, has innate behaviors of biting, and they're not over the top. Some breeds have innate behaviors of chasing and biting and, um, you know, are kind of wired to whatever they have in their mouth uh, to never let go. So with those particular dogs, maybe tug of war isn't the right game. And other dogs are not really interested in chasing something or biting something. And then trying to play tug of war um, could be a really big uh, task. So one of the things that um, we should um, do before we even think about you know, playing tug of war is like I mentioned in my previous uh, lecture, um, what dog do I have? And that's a question we always need to ask ourselves every morning we wake up. And like in my previous lecture, you should forget the dog that you want because you're never gonna get it. Because you have the dog that you have. And the dog that you have, again, is all dependent on you know, the, the genetic makeup. And what, what breed is it? Breed, and then um, in the breed, what genotype of the breed. Like I mentioned before, within the German Shepherd, there are 17 different genotypes, so it's because it, it looks like a German Shepherd, that might not mean that it actually is a German Shepherd. Um, um, yesterday I did a lecture um, about feeding the dogs and we, we, we talked about um, phenotype versus genotype um, because I was talking about an ancestral diet. And um, I made the comparison between a French bulldog and a German shepherd. And what's the, what's the, uh, the similarities? Well, a French bulldog comes from the German shepherd. So when um, when you have, when you do a DNA test for Embark and uh, you get the results back, oh, I don't have a pure uh, French Bulldog because it has German Shepherd in it. Well, that is genetically correct because the ancestry of a French Bulldog is the German Shepherd. Um, so that many people don't, uh, don't know that. So um, then when people say, oh, my, my, my my uh, French Bulldog likes to bite. My French uh, Bulldog likes to chase things. Well, what is the genetic makeup of the French Bulldog? Is He's got a, a lot of residual German Shepherd DNA in it. That's where he comes from. So hence, we're going to see that kind of stuff. So genotypic, these genotypes are extremely important. 
Um, then the other thing that we need to look for is the antecedents. And then uh, antecedents often in the genotype, but also and the antecedents in, um, you know, what has the dog done as a job for generations with a breeder. Yeah, I always tell people, I make this joke, you know, I come from a family of assholes. My father was an asshole, my grandfather was an asshole, my great-grandfather was an asshole, and I'm an asshole. And the reason why I am is because I was, spoke, was exposed to assholeness. Yeah? Um, so, so when you're exposed to um, musicians, for instance, then um, many people, many kids actually pick up music because, you know, if the father plays an instrument and the grandfather plays an instrument and the mom plays an instrument and kind of everybody plays an instrument, the likelihood that you are going to be interested in, um, in playing an instrument is pretty high. You know, when you look at alcoholism, for instance, um, that is a um, observed uh, behavior or a modeled behavior that is, you know, over the years, um, eventually has become part of, uh, uh, you know, genetic uh, malfunction. But the the start of ad addictive or, or addiction is because of people have uh, been exposed to addiction and they have seen it and it's been modeled. And now that modeling becomes an innate behavior. And once that becomes an innate behavior, it actually can become a genetic trait. But that takes years, um, years of exposure, you know. Um, for instance, you know, I've, I've, I've been involved in some uh, research about, you know, um, inheritary diseases for humans, you know. Um, it really depends on the nutrition from the parents. So, for instance, if you, and the same with dogs, if the dogs come from lines that have been fed um, bad food, for instance, and then, you know, yesterday, I kind of, you know, I, I, in, my, in my nutrition class, I kind of debunk the, the, the myth of uh, kibble. And um, if, uh, if, if we have generations of kibble-fed dogs that um, produces, you know, inheritory diseases or can produce uh, diseases, eventually all these offspring um, can, you know, will, will, will already uh, start developing these diseases and over many generations now we have a new d uh, genetic disease and with, with people it's the same thing, you know, if you come from a family that eats a lot of uh, fast food, you know, over the years, then obesity is probably one of the things, diabetes is one of the things that is genetically in, uh, programmed in your, in your genes, so all these antecedents are very important. So knowing where your dog comes from and knowing the genetic makeup will eventually determine how we're going to interact with it, how we're going to um, uh, play with it, you know, what job that we're going to do. So if you have, um, for instance, Ken, where is he? If you have uh, dogs that, you know, are bred for uh, search and rescue work, are bred for nose work, or are bred for detection work, Probably doing uh, some apprehension work is not not a good idea. Um, it, it's it's going to lead to a lot of frustration because um, the dog is so used to you know working with his nose that actually um, chasing something and biting something is not inherently there. It's not a genetic trait. And trying to force that dog into the job of protection or apprehension um, is probably the wrong thing to do. And doing so, um, in my opinion, uh, forcing a dog in a job that he shouldn't do is for me uh, very abusive. Yeah? But if we, if we come from search and rescue lines, then you know, most likely the games that we're going to play with these dogs are send games. Yeah? If I have... Um, uh, a, a dog, for instance, that is genetically wired to herding, one of the things that I could do is what? Play herd games, yeah? Let's get a couple of goats and chickens and uh, geese, and then, you know, well, let's play uh, herd games. So herding dogs, in general, likes to chase, likes to herd. 
et cetera, et cetera. So all these antecedents where, you know, are going to eventually determine what dog I'm going to play with. The other, um, and I would say almost most important um, uh, factor is what mind state is my dog in? If I have a really anxious dog that um, I'm going to play tug of war uh, uh, with, and he perceives that game as a real fight. Yeah, I'm going to, I, while I'm playing tug of war, I'm literally fighting over something. I want to possess really something. And he's not sure about himself and he's not sure about you and he's not sure about the game itself. But one of the things that's going to happen is that the game is going to reinforce that anxiety and is going to reinforce the the battle that he has with you. So then playing with that dog in a dog that has anxious mind state, playing tug of war with him is, is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Yeah? So when a dog, um, when a dog is completely um, ball obsessed, for instance, but he's very worried about the interaction that he has with you with the ball, then playing with the ball is probably the wrong thing to do. Because what we're doing is that because he's so ball obsessed and then we still give him the um, satisfaction of playing with the ball, um, but we're also reinforcing the, uh, the doubt and the anxiety that he has towards us. So now um, um, what I see a lot with, uh, with uh, with these dogs and people is that once the dog possesses the ball, then uh, the dog is going to play keep away yeah? and I'll try to get it, motherfucker. And then I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring it back. Yeah. Or then when you try to get close to the ball, he's never letting it go. And then when you reach out for his mouth, there's a little snarl. There's a little whale eye. So you don't get this because I don't trust you. Yeah. Or he starts like spinning around. It's like this uh, tornado, um, and the dog is start chasing his tail with his ball in his mouth because he's trying to avoid every interaction with the environment that he has. Because the only thing that gives him comfort is the pacifier that he has in his mouth, but everything else in his environment drives him crazy. So then, playing with the ball would that be a good idea? Probably not. Yeah, because we reinforce that anxiety. So for me, mind state is super important. Yeah, but mind state and uh, you know geno, uh, genotypes and you know gen genetic and hereditary traits uh, and uh, antecedents of the dog um, kind of go hand in hand. Um, so one of the things that I like to do um, when I when I you know play with the dog is um, eventually I want to calm and focus mind state, and for me. Um, Playing is all about the interaction with the handler, is not about the interaction with the object. Yeah, like feeding, like hand feeding. You know, we learned yesterday um, that wolves, um, when they chase, we saw a, 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 a pack of wolf kill a bison yesterday in, in the lecture on, uh, on, on video, not live. I didn't have a bison and pack of wolves in the garage, <laughs> trust me. But um, so that, that's a big event, yeah? It's, uh, and all their senses are, are at work. Their ears, their eyes, their nose, their communication. They look at each other. And so they, it's, a, it's a big mental game. Um, and they get a lot of um, you know, mental satisfaction um, out of the hunt. So that mind state is very focused, yeah? However, the driver to eat is survival. The mind is very focused on the task. And one of the issues that I see with dogs is that the mind is very focused on the object and not so much on the task and not so much on the interaction that the dog has with the environment and that the dog has with the handler, you. And that the, the human is often perceived as a uh, interference with that interaction with the ball rather than a contributing factor. Yeah, so when, when, um, when people play with their dogs, even dogs, their dogs, you know, chase the ball and they retrieve it, um, 
the question that we need to ask ourselves, is that game between you and the dog perceived as fun? Or is the game between the dog and the ball perceived as fun? And are you either a neutral person? Or are you either a person that interferes with this game? Or are you a person that contributes and add value to the game? That is, that is the biggest question that we... Hey, sweetie. Um, my sister just walked in. Um, that is that is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Yeah, we need to. Our goal is that with every interaction that we have with a dog, we add value, and that again is very controlled by how the dog feels and thinks. So, whether you play tug of war with the dog, it's really going to be dependent on all these factors. And one of the things that I like to do when I meet a new dog um, is kind of test how the dog interacts. Sometimes I would throw a ball in, in the garage and I'm just going to observe him. If the ball rolls away and the dog is like, yeah. <laughs> you want to get it? Are you going to get it? Should I get it? Come on, get it. Then I know that that's probably not the right uh, game for him. But then when I start moving or moving towards the ball, and then the dog goes to the, to the other side, I say, hey, I'm going to get it, or are you going to get it? <laughs> oh. And then I move away again. I say, hey, that's a herder. So the interaction that he has with me is much more fun because what he wants to do is he wants to prevent me getting to that thing. I said, oh, this is my, my stuff. And so he has a lot of enjoyment just keeping me away from the ball. Oh, now I have something to think about. I said, oh, I know what, what game that, that guy likes. Yeah. Or, you know, when I toss the ball in this uh, garage and the first thing that he does is like, look at me, then spits to the ball, grab it, hugs it. Then I say, oh. That's probably not the right game for this dog. And then um, when I throw a ball and he goes like, he forgets me, dives to the ball, brings it back, drops it. <laughs> you throw it again, <laughs> retrieves. <laughs> then I know that he's obsessed by what? By the chase, yeah? He doesn't give a shit about the ball. He gives about anything that I throw. So then what I'm going to do is I grab this towel and I'm going to throw it. And if he chases a towel and he's a like, <laughs> Throw it again, I say, oh, wow, this is obviously somebody who likes, you know, and enjoys uh, retrieving. And then um, if I throw a ball and now the dog grabs it and he, he starts vigorously uh, trashing it, then I say, ah, now I got something. This guy probably likes tug of war. Yeah, and then slowly but surely, I'm going to grab my handle. I, I like to play with balls with a handle. And then if I go this way, <laughs> then I know that my ball, my, my, my dog likes to tug, etc, etc. And then um, if, he, if he wins, and um, my dog's then like, I don't know about you anymore, but I start, then I say, hey, look at this. Then um, uh, I know that I have an issue, then the dog doesn't really trust me in the game. Or if I have a dog that, you know, just latches on and I can lift him up, and you just say, he's got jaw lock. <laughs> you know, put him down and he goes, <laughs> well, then I know a dog that is really possessive. It's a, once I have it, it's mine. Is that a dog that I should play tug of war with? Well, maybe, yeah. Well, some some bully breeds um, would be I would advise not to do it because we could, you know, trigger a lot of innate responses that we don't want, and then some others are maybe maybe suitable. But it's kind of an exploration of what we're going to do. Yes, sir, you have a question. Our dog does all of it. His dog does all of it. He does chasing. He holds it. So. Um, so some dogs do, yeah, it's not just one thing, it's like, wow, I love retrieving, but then once I have it, I'm going to trash it, 
And um, once I kind of had a feel for this, you have a shepherd, yeah? Once I have a feel for this, hmm, I'm gonna hold on to this motherfucker. And then when you try to grab it, he said, no, it's mine. <laughs> and he really likes the game. And so what you see, it's a trait that many German shepherds have. And why do they do it? Because they're chasers, there's herding, there's, um, they have um, antecedents of bite work, they like to possess stuff. There's a lot of wolf stuff in them, wolf uh, residual wolf DNA in the working dog. So yes, your shepherd should show everything. That means that you have a really good shepherd. It's a shepherd that likes the job, likes to work. Yeah, so it's not that you just have one particular trait, you know, you see that with, uh, with labs too, you know, um, what was it last week we talked about, um, you know, the, uh, again, the genotypes, you know, uh, 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 work with a dog you have, forgot, forget the dog you want, and um, the question that I asked there is, um, where does Labradors come from, you know? Labrador, it's a little city fishing village in Canada, and those uh, those uh, um, those dogs were bred to uh, to fish. Yeah, they were fishers. You know, they they would go fish and get salmon out of the water, but they also would uh, help uh, uh, bring in the nets from trawling. So they would run out in the ocean, they grab the nets, and then they pull it, help pull it to the to the shore. And then people say, yeah, I have a black lab, it's a working lab, or I have a chocolate lab, and it pulls like a motherfucker. <laughs> well, what was his job? Oh, pulling nets on the shore. So yeah, he's a he's a pulling dog. So, but he also likes to chase. He also likes to bring things. You know, um, they, they've been eventually used for hunting, duck hunting a lot, which is retrieving, but also also holding something. You know, and then the, the, the hunter would toss something that he could eat himself and then he grabs it, trashes it and says, hey, I have a lot of fun with it. So you see a lot of these, um, you know, these behaviors you see back into play. You know, uh, dogs like look to entertain themselves. So I said, hey, if I actually can run to, run to get something, bring it back, uh, give it to you and then you hold it back and now I can trash it a little bit, I'm in heaven because all these stuff I like to do genetically. Yeah. Um, however, we need to be really careful. And what we need to be careful for is that with every interaction that we do that increases intensity in the dog, that we don't lose the mind. Yeah, that we just not go and um, the dog is completely focused on the object and not the task and not the interaction. And I see that with a lot of um, breeds that um, start to be overbred, that we call that drive, prey drive development, you know, is, is something that a lot of breeders have wanted in their working dogs because of various dog sports. You know, if I take the Malinois, for example, you know, when I grew up as a kid, the Malinois was a very, I mean, not calm, but a very balanced dog. It had a good on and off switch. Um, but it wasn't as prey crazy as the Malin was that you see today. And now um, a lot of the, you know, the French uh, bred Malin was and a lot of the Malin was here in the States uh, look like a Malin was, but for me have nothing to do with the Malin was that I actually grew up with, you know, the old NVBK style, uh, big, um, you know, big, very composed um, and Malin was with a lot of clarity. And, um, you know, when I talk to people from my generation and, you know, uh, or the older generation, we all kind of see the same things. And then the, the younger generation breeders, they all breed these like, oh, yeah, this, this dog won a title and that dog won a title and we're going to breed them together. And you have no idea what the outcome is because there's no, no research done. It's just bred for, hey, this is a world champion and that's a world champion and that's a world champion. And this one looks good and this one has a trophy and that wasn't a trophy. And that's, you know, trophies makes really good genetics. <laughs> yeah, and that's unfortunately what happens. And that's why we end up with breeds now that when we play with them, where drives are overdeveloped and can bite us in the ass. And then so... If, if we would play like we would play with a dog that has, with a dog that was originally bred, we, we would shoot ourselves in the foot because we genetically, we don't have the same 
um, dog. And I always you know, make the, the uh, comparison, you know, you have a Ford tractor and you have a Ford Mustang, are you gonna plow your land with a Ford Mustang? Or are you going to go on a drag race with your Ford tractor? Well, you can, but it's not gonna be fun. And you bring your, your Ford Mustang, you're gonna play on, on a farm and try to plow the land with it, it's, you're not gonna come, go far. So eventually, you know, it, it's not because it carries the brand uh, Ford and it's not because of, uh, it's a car that you can do the same thing with it. So with the dogs, it's the same, the same thing. Um, so intensity of a game is a really good thing because eventually a good intense game can bring a lot of satisfaction, can bring a lot of um, fulfillment of motivation. But on the other, the, on the flip side, it can give us a lot of trouble. It can give a dog that loses his mind and that can't think crazy. And it's kind of what we call um, in the sport dog world, prey locked. The only thing that can think of is, is getting that object, is chasing it. And um, they will scream, they will howl, they will dig, they will do anything just to get it. Once they see that ball, they're tilt. They can't think of anything anymore. Yeah? And then um, playing with that particular dog, um, a very intense game, is only going to do, do what? reinforce that crazy prey drive mind state so probably we need to be very careful how intense we play with these dogs and what type of game that we are going to play allowing that dog to play tug of war very rigorously is probably not a good idea maybe we we need to play hide and seek with the ball that there's still interaction with the ball but that we lower those intensities yeah and that is very very important that we start to understand is what effect has that toy or the interaction with the toy um, to my dog. And, you know, is he going to play keep away? Does he lose his mind? Is he getting possessive? Is he getting aggressive? And, and all that stuff. And if we do not do our, you know, due diligence and research, then just going out with your dog and grabbing a toy and playing is the dumbest thing you can do. Yeah. So, one of the things that, um, are there any questions maybe online or uh, any comments? They love your rich language. They love my rich language? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, anybody has offended by swear words, they know where to go. Yeah. Um, so, um, one of the things that I like to do is when I play with a dog is um, try to mimic um, what happens when dogs play in the wild. Whether it's with each other, whether they find a stick, whether they find a salmon, whether they find some leaves that they can roll in and dive in. Um, or wh whether it's, you know, they found a rabbit and now they're going to play um, who gets the biggest piece and in how many pieces can we rip this little oh, is a fucking bunny apart. <laughs> um, so, and, and all these, all these uh, interactions, they have rules. Yeah? Let's call them rules of play. Yeah? And within those rules of play, um, dogs and you know, and especially when we look at wolves, they because they're wolves and it's a genetic uh, trait. They kind of know the rules and boundaries and limitations in how they can interact with each other. You know how how hard can they bite? How hard can they bite each other? How hard can they bite the mom? Um, uh, can they rip? Can they t play tug of? war with the ears you know if i have my boy uh little guy and my little my little female uh popsy um she loves to uh tug on ears and little guy has different rules than Riker. Riker says that oh, just gently please and then um little guy says oh, you can rip those motherfuckers off and said i don't care um and then it's funny because with, you know, when, when, when Popsy starts interacting with, with these dogs, she interacts differently. 
you know, she's way more careful with Riker's ears until, unless she wants to give him the little middle finger and this says, now I'm going to get you. And then with uh, the game with, um, with little guy is way more intense. And the, the reason why they, they can do that is because the dog has set rules, boundaries, and limitations in, you know, what is appropriate to play, you know. If Popsy bites little guy in his testicles, the guy says, that's probably the wrong place to bite, and he's going to let my, my female know that, hey, we're not biting my testicles, I don't like it, which is a very genetic thing to do because dogs, um, when they do stuff, they grab the, the feet, they grab the testicles, they grab the limbs, they try to drag um, the other dog down, try to dominate them. Yeah? So there's, there's areas you know, of the body that they like to bite in order to, like, you know, stop movement or, you know, interact with them. But these guys have rules of, of uh, games. And the way they're able to do that is to communicate. Yeah? They, they have, they communicate uh, with each other. Um, and they do that with body language. They do that with tactile stimulation. And they do that with audible stimulation, you know? Um, they, they bite each other, they touch each other, they, you know, they say, hey, uh, do it a little bit rougher or do it a little bit less rough. Um, or they're chasing one ball together and one goes, Ugh. that's the communication, that is my ball, you back off. You know, or rah, 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 rah. and this is, again, it's like my, my ball, or they start uh, barking at each other. You know, rah, 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 rah. and what is that? It's like uh, they're frustrated. And they have no idea who's going to do what uh, uh, first. But they do that with communicating uh, with each other. So they have rules, boundaries, limitations in the game. So they have uh, uh, rules of engagement. And then they communicate um, within those rules of engagement when things go r r right, when things go wrong, uh, or when they're like, oh my god, this was super happy. You know, we're super happy with each other. Um, if we play with our dogs, um, in most cases, the dog sets the rules, boundary, and its limitations. And dad, you're going to stay the fuck away from my ball, OK? Because I'm going to hurt you. And then if uh, you tug with me a little bit and you come a little bit closer to my mouth, I'm going to growl at you. And then you're going to let go. And then I'm going to win. And I'm going to hide it. I'm going to bury it. And if you want to come to my berry p uh, uh, place, I'm going to pee on it. Because now it's mine. And you don't touch it because I growl at you. Yeah? Or I'm going to have you. Tug with me, and I never let go. Yeah, this happens to her. He's, he's, he's got an amazing out. He's not. He's an, doesn't have an out. But the dog enjoys it, and he enjoys it. Yeah, but they communicate about it. However, the the biggest problem that we have is we don't normally do this, and we absolutely don't communicate really well. The biggest thing with dogs is that there is really no surprise in their game. They, have, they can really predict what the other is going to do and what to expect. With us, it's all guesswork. And when it's guesswork, what happens with the mind? It goes all places, yeah? I don't know what's going to happen. So they wind themselves up. Hence. To chuck it. You have a ball. You have those chuck it launchers. The dog has zero idea where that ball is going to end up. Maybe 70% of the time it's going to go in a straight line. And then 10% of the time dad had a bad swing. And the ball goes to the right. And then the ball goes to the left. And then he did one of those things. And the ball flies backwards. But the dog is like, <laughs> where, where the hell is going to go, yeah? And then when we don't have a chuck it and we just throw the ball everywhere. Melody, this is one for you. We're going to call it a melody throw. Well, there's no melody. Melody's on my camera right there. <laughs> Me Melody's watching right now. So we, I always make fun of Melody. I said, because the melody throw is we don't know where the ball goes. Is it hanging in the tree? Does it end up with my neighbor? Is it she still in her pocket because she thought she threw the ball, but she forgot to take it out, and then the dog is biting her pocket? You know, there's, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that can happen um, where the dog says, I don't know what to expect. Yeah? So expectation in games 
uh, is happening. And there's, uh, in, in wild games, when the dogs play with each other, they have expectations too. And what do expectations uh, eventually result is in, in what? Anticipation, yeah? You know, you see this, uh, you worked your entire um, months your ass off and then the expectation is that eventually you're going to get your paycheck and then on payday there's a little bit of anticipation that yeah today's the day i'm going to get paid and then your boss says Whoop. <laughs> sorry motherfucker no pay what does that lead to frustration yeah and then frustration so when anticipation is not there that leads to frustration and frustration is one of the biggest poisons that we have when we interact with our dogs. And the reason why is we are very bad in playing with our dogs. Yeah, playing with the dogs is extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah, uh, forget training. Training, you know, sits, downs and stands is probably much easier than actually playing with the dog. Playing is for me, in my opinion, the most difficult thing that you can do with a dog and hence I don't teach people to play with their dogs unless they're a couple months with me. Because it's very, very, very difficult to play good with your dog. So the dog perceives your interaction as fun, perceives the game as zero competition and has zero uh, possessiveness over the object that you play with and he doesn't care what object you play with whether it's a beer can or a soda can or this paper towel roll or his ball or a shoe or whatever but that the interaction that the dog has with you no matter what object there is is fun and that's what what wolves do that's what dogs do in in when you when you put a couple dogs out in the in the pasture Sometimes they find a stick, sometimes they find a pine cone, sometimes they, you know, grab a lid of a garbage can and play with that. Sometimes they just chase each other around. Sometimes they hop on tables and on, you know, on when, when I'm on my, my training fields, there's agility equipment. And then sometimes I see the dogs using the equipment, chasing through the tunnels, jumping over the tunnels. They interact with each other. And then sometimes they're just laying down, gnawing on one, uh, one on one side of the stick and the other gnaws on the other side of the stick. But what they do know is that they have a lot of fun together and that the interaction, and that is why, you know, when you let dogs play with other dogs, it's probably not a good idea uh, as well, because what the dog is learning is that the interaction with other dogs is more fun than the interaction with you as a human. And the reason why is because there's good rules of engagement, there is amazing communication, and the expectation and anticipation are always fulfilled, and there's hardly any frustration. Yeah? And then, of course, there's exceptions. You know, when you, play, when you put uh, two very dominant uh, ones that say, I don't know about you. Is that your ball or my ball? Want to test it? That's probably not the good idea. I'm like, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna chase me? Come, you're still slow. Bite you in the ass, and I'm out of there. Yeah. So that's that's what you see sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes dogs start to test each other. But what are they doing when they test each other? It's like when your dog is like, you know. Testing dominance. Nope. Nothing. Not to do with dominance. They're doing this. What are the rules? What are the rules of the game here? If you don't gonna show me rules, I'm gonna make them up. Yeah. It's like, say again? Our dog's making her own rules. Yeah, of course, yeah. If you don't do it for them, they, they need to do it because they need rules. And they, they're really good in it. They're really, really, really good in it. And they're really good in communicating with it. My ball, motherfucker. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, that's what they do. They make their own rules. And you know what we do then? We get pissed. 
We got pissed. Yeah? So as a puppy, as a puppy, you start teasing the dog with a little rag or your sock, or you buy like one of the squishy toys, and then he bites it a little bit, and then he pulls it out. Oh my god, isn't he cute? Yeah, and he runs away with it, and then you grab something else, and you teach your little puppy, and then he comes and bites it, and then grabs it out of your hand, and runs away with it. It's like, oh my god, I love this dog. <laughs> and you grab something else. So what are you doing? You're being his bitch. <laughs> yeah, that eight-week-old puppy has got like, hey, look at you. I'm eight weeks old, it's your three-year-old that walks into the house and sets rule boundaries and limitations. Mom, you're going to feed me? And now you clean up my little poo poo. Yeah? And I'm going to show a hissy fit. And then you give me your iPad. And I'm going to wake up for, uh, shut up for a little bit. And then when your credits run out, I'm going to cry again. So you then you can buy more, more coins. And then we quiet again. That's what happens, yeah? So um, our dogs make our own rules. And they're really good in communicating with it, too. And then eventually, what's going to happen is we expect that the dog eventually would let go of the ball when we say out. Say, out, what well, out? Never out in my life. Always chugged it out of your hands and ran off with it. And now I'm a year old. I'm going to do that again. And if you hold on to it, this, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to shake it a little bit more. So you're like a rag doll on the end of the ball. And then, you know, I, I ripped your arms out of the socket and you let go of the ball. What did I just do? I made more rules. The rougher I fight, the faster I win. Yeah, and now you're like, okay, now I'm going to hold on to the ball. Now dogs don't go, urgh, 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 urgh. And, and then he doesn't let go. So what are you doing? You're competing. You're competing. So what you should do is just, here, man, play your fucking ball yourself. I'm done. I hate your games. I just walk off. Now the dog's gonna say, like, what? Pooh. And let's go to the ball. Are you okay, ma'am? <laughs> yeah? So now the poo. Yeah. I was like, pick on a goddamn ball. No, yeah, I hate your games. Hurts my back. Now the dog grabs the ball, runs off. And now it's like, shit. What am I going to do with the ball then? Chew it. And then slowly but surely, the dog has less fun with his ball. You know why? Because we told him that this rule sucks. And slowly but surely, the dog's going to do other stuff. Yeah, and then he's going to maybe start nipping and then we're going to start yelling at the dog or we don't we want him to stop and then out. The dog's like motherfucker. <laughs> Let's go of the ball. And we turn into a maniac. We told him one year long that he could possess the ball and then out of the blue we turn into this brainiac that now because he has a sore back or something that he doesn't want to pull anymore and now we suddenly are going to start ranking over the dog. Now it's my ball. Ah, it's your ball. I well, guess what I can do. I can tug a little bit more. You can yell. <laughs> I, I can tug. And then you start yelling and now the dog gives you the whale eye. Gives you that one little teat. Like, oh, I'm done. Ooh. Or you start beating the dog, and then the whole games go to shit. And I see that with so many clients. And the reason why is because this is not in place. And so one of the things that I've done over the years is I made, I made numerous mistakes in playing with the dogs. You know, I fell into the trap of, um, you know, being a thief all the time because my, my dog will bring his ball back. And the one thing that I did is I poked it out of his mouth. I have this like in, incredible trick. I grab the ball with one hand and I poke him in the, on the tonsils. And uh, I'm, I'm like this big asshole because I hurt him a little bit. Goes, like, what the fuck? And then he, he, this is mine. You know, and then I play keep away. I've, I've done these stupid games. Um, and then, you know, my dogs, 
didn't really like playing with me. And so I was a tyrant at that particular moment. I was an asshole. I didn't make clear rules. And um, over the years, I've developed what I call a two ball game. And a two ball game um, is a game that I developed where we are going to teach the dog rules of play. So my two ball game is a game that can include tug, but does not necessarily means that he needs to play uh, tug, that the dog can um, retrieve the ball, possess the ball for as long as he wants, and um, he can chase the ball, he can bring the ball back, and he could tug. But what I'm going to teach the dog is that the interaction between me and the toy is the most awesomest thing on the planet. And that my dog will push me to interact with the ball as well. Please, Dad, can you play with the ball? Yeah? And so um, that two-ball game has rules, boundaries, limitations, you know, um, but also has communication. One of the first things that I'm going to teach the dog is that when I, when I develop this, this, this game, I start with puppies. You know, I start with a puppy that is maybe 10 weeks old, you know, 10, 11 weeks old. And I literally, I, I sit on the ground. There's videos in my From Tyrant to Teacher video and, and in our Facebook group. But I sit on the ground and I have, I have literally two balls. And I just start interacting with the ball. And then one of the, thing, one of the things that I do is I'm going to just roll that ball away. And I'm going to see what the dog is doing. I'm going to see if the dog is going to chase that ball. And then when he chases that ball, I want to see if he grabs the ball. And if he doesn't grab the ball, then I'll, I'll interact with the ball that he just chased. And I'll chase it with him. And then I'll play with that ball until he grabs it. And then when he grabs it, I'm going to move away from the ball. And then I'm going to see if the dog actually wants to keep it or does he wants to bring it back. And then when he brings it back, then I'm going to tell him that he's a really good puppy. So I'm going to interact with him via communication. I'm going to say, good puppy. I'm not going to touch the ball. That's very important. Because if I would touch the ball, what am I putting all the focus on? The ball. The ball. Not about the interaction with me. So I'm going to touch the puppy. I'm going to say, oh my god, good puppy. I'm going to tell him, good, good job. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to play with my ball. I've got two balls, and I'm going to play with my ball. I'm going to ignore the puppy and just play with my ball. And the puppy's like, hey, what are you doing? And he drops his ball. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to toss the ball that I'm playing with. He's like, wait a minute. I can chase that thing again? This is cool. And then a couple things can happen. Either he can go pick up the ball, he can interact with the ball, he can just stand in front of the ball, but whatever he does, if he doesn't bring the ball back, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go there and go to push it again until he grabs it in his mouth, and I'm going to run away, and I'm going to see if he brings it back, if he possesses it, and he just keeps it in his mouth. All I'm going to do is just wait and play with my ball. And what am I teaching the dog? That the fun is not about the stuff that you possess. But the fun is with what I throw away and what I interact with. Yeah? And so the biggest mistake when, <laughs> when people start playing with the balls or with toys is that they always play with one toy from the get-go. And they're always grabbing the toy out of the dog's mouth. You know why? Because the human likes to throw it. They think that is fun. Yeah? 
So the first thing that we teach the dog is that you're a very untrustworthy guy whenever it comes to things that the dog brings because you're going to rank over him and just dominate, grab his muzzle, take it out, throw it away. And now the dog is like, okay, I'll chase it because I really like chasing him, but I don't really like this stuff. And eventually they become possessive over the ball. And then we, we yell out and, and stuff like that. So the reason why I play with puppies like that, the way I, I, I play with puppies in the beginning, is the dog needs to learn that it's not about the toy. Like with pups in a pack, it's about the interaction that the pup has with me. And that I, I, I take the focus away, I take the focus away from the object. And I put the focus away towards the interaction that I have with the object. And then eventually, when my pup gets really good in like bringing the ball back, and is basically I'm developing kind of a retrieve, I'm going to start marking this. I'm going to say yes. Every time I throw the ball away, forward. So the pup comes, he drops his ball in front of me, I take another ball, I say yes, and I just throw that ball forward. It doesn't need to be far, it's not about far, far, far creates intensity. It's just about go pick that ball up. And I do this in the garage here. I never play outside, too much distractions in the beginning. I just play out here in the garage, I toss it maybe five, six, seven, ten feet, and my dog brings it back, and guess what I do? He drops it, I say yes, and I throw the ball forward. So what does that do? The same like a clicker. So I'm conditioning the dog that every time I say yes, what happens? The ball goes forward. Does the dog need to guess where the ball is? No. Does the, ball, does the dog has any doubt what my intentions are? No. Because every time I say yes, what am I doing? I throw that ball forward. And that makes me what? Very predictable and makes the anticipation of what you're going to do very clear and it's going to end in what? Success. He runs forward, he finds the ball. <laughs> so once that is established, I'm going to do it another word. You don't need to use the words, you can use pineapple and strawberry and whatever word you want to use. But I use avaya. And when I use avaya, I throw my ball backwards. Boop, throw my ball backwards. So now the dog brings the ball back and I say avaya, and I throw the ball backwards. Guess what's going to happen? Dog looks at me and he hears yes, what is going to do? run forward. He hears a via, what he's going to do, Choom! and he goes backwards. And now he says, wow, this is awesome. I can start trusting this guy. This guy's not a liar. This is pretty cool. I just need to look at him. He's going to tell me what to do. And he does it in a game. Oh, this is cool. I'm going to give him a little bit more chances here. And now I'm going to say, hey, I'm Flemish, so I say rechts, and I throw the ball right. I say links, and I throw the ball left. Oh, that's cool. So now the dog comes to me with his ball, poo, and drops it, and he grabs the ball. What am I doing? Think I would grab that ball too, or what would I do? You just say one of those words? No. He gets the ball in his mouth. Talk to the back, motherfucker. I'm not playing with you. I'm just, I'm, I'm done. Bye. I'm out of here. No dog's like, what? So I'm teaching him that eventually 
if it drops it, we're going to have fun with the ball. But when he keeps it in his mouth, I'm going to play with mine. I'm going to play with my ball till he drops it. Yes. And then I give him something. Then the other thing that I let him do, I have a bite command. And that bite command, I, I use bite, and the reason why I use bite is when people, when I'm in public and they know I have protection dogs, they always say, bite! And then he comes running to me to grab a ball out of my hand. Because bite means come get the ball out of my hand. Which is eventually my recall command. And I scare people shitless. And my dog runs towards anybody and I yell, bite! And there's <laughs> a little poo came out, but my dog has a recall. Oh, that's a little joke that I do with my protection dogs. <laughs> yeah, come get the ball out of my, my hands. Yeah. Yeah. People call me an asshole then. Is that lame? I said you're playing. Mm -hmm. I'm playing. Yeah, so but bite means whatever I have in my hand, whatever I have in my hands, you come and grab that thing and yank that out of my hand as good as you can. I'm allowing my dog to yank something out of my hand. Oh, wow, that's cool. Okay. And then when he has it, guess what? It's his. I'm not there. I'm not going to chase him. I told him, whatever I have is yours. Whatever you have is yours. I didn't say I'm going to play with that item. I just said, wherever you are in your environment, whenever you hear bite, you turn around as fast as you can and you can have whatever I have. Whether it's a ball, a tug, a human, <laughs> whatever you want. Mark, you have a comment here. The typical manner in which people communicate with dogs or other people is the opposite way to establish a healthy relationship with the dog. Mutual respect, rules, reasonable uh, expectation, consideration of who the dog slash person is as opposed to who we want them to be. Oh, the comment's gone. So, um, yeah, chap, very good comment. So chap says the typical manner in which people communicate with dogs and other people is the opposite way to establish a healthy relationship with a dog. Mutual respect rules, reasonable expectations, considerations of who the dog person is as opposed to who we want them to be. So yes, uh, very good. You guys going? Oh, Jeremy and Nico, good. Yeah, then I have another um, uh, command um, that I use, and that means let's play. And that means tug of war. So if I say that to my dog, I am going to play a good game of tug of war, which is very, very hard. And I need to teach you how to play tug of war. But I'm going to, after I, um, I'm, I'm going to allow my dog to now tug with me on the toy. And guess what? My dog always, always, always wins. I never win. My dog always wins. And then eventually, I'll let go of the ball, and guess what? In order for him to continue playing, what does he need to do? Come to me and drop the ball. And ask what? Hey, Dad, can we play? And then I continue. Then I can say, yes, yes. I throw the ball forward, the dog comes towards me. Let's play, and now the dog literally hands me the ball in my hands. Why? Because he wants to play tug of war. Why? Because I told him we're going to. 
If I say links, poof, I throw the ball to my left. I say, let's play. The dog comes right there. Comes, shove the balls into my, my, my belly, and I play a good tug of war. Yeah? Then the other thing that I have is when he has it in his mouth, I will tell him switch. And I want him to switch toys. Whatever you have in his mouth, don't drop it, just switch to mine. Whenever I have him tugging on one ball, I grab another one, I say switch. I want you to switch to the ball. And I say switch, 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 switch. My dog like clunk, 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 clunk. And he switched from one ball to the other. What does that do? It eliminates possessiveness. It brings focus to what? Interaction between you and the tug and the ball. And you add a lot of value. You think he can do that by himself, like switching balls? Oh, when he's got multiple in his mouth, maybe. Yeah? And that's how I eventually play tug. What is not... Yeah, hold that question. What is not in here? Out! What am I telling my dog not to do? To give up what he has. I'm not a rule breaker or fun witch. You know what I do with him? Before I play, I tell him, let's have fun. Which, with my dogs, my cue is let's work, because playing is working. And then when my game is over, I say all done. And then I grab the ball that he dropped, I put it in my pocket, I walk to my house, put the balls away, and I'm done. I always say that to my dog. I tell him when I'm gonna start playing, I tell him when I'm done playing. And sometimes what I do is I grab my balls, I have them in my pocket, I go to my yard. I think you need to go peepees. You need to go peepees, me? <laughs> I already went peepees. You go on peepees? <laughs> okay, good. So it's not because I have a ball that we're going to play. You're going to do peepees. And then I walk him inside. I put my balls away. And that's that. And I take my balls. I'm going to go. I'm going to go in the car. I'm going to go for a car ride. Dogs jump in the back seat. Go home. Grab my balls. Put my balls away, and the dog's back home. What am I doing? It's not because I have balls that we're going to play. It's because I tell you to play. So then I have balls. Put my balls in my pocket. Got my little, little, little vest on. Oh, that's a crayon. Hang on, I got some technical difficulties here. Got my balls. What's that? It's not because I have a ball that it's available. It's food. Or it's not, now I have food in my pocket, I got steak. Yes, and I toss my ball. It's not because I have food in my pocket that it's available. I'm gonna tell you when it's available. Yes, bite, Avaya. Let's work, all done. And that, my friends, 
de soi. Creates a calm mind. And why? Expectations. Yes, expectations. What did you? He knows what to expect. He doesn't need to look at you and then. What are you? What are you gonna do? You take my ball. You're gonna chase and all that stuff. You become a very consistent, clear communicator that does what he says he's going to do. And that makes you what? Very trustworthy. But there's a key element in that game. How is he going to figure out what is going to be done? By looking at you. By paying attention to you. By being engaged with you. By being focused with you. By being focused in the game, not when he's batshit rat crazy. No. What? Why are we doing that? Yes, if I the bite, just tell me. And that's why I developed that two ball game. And so, guess what? Your dog does not like to tug. Hang on. Find it. And you hide the ball. Yeah? Easy. Your dog does not like to bite. To, to grab it to fly through the air and try to rip your hand off. I'll demonstrate everything. Today, don't worry about it. No, you don't need it. Mine bites bad. Good. Good? My arms? Yeah, it's amazing. That's what it should be doing. You just don't like it. That's your problem, not your dog's. If you want it to stop, we can fix that. But it's not your dog's fault. So don't try your dog don't try to stop your dog. Change your behavior in order for him to, do another, to make another choice. Because you can't... If I would slap you for yawning, would you, what well, would you think I am? Mean. I'm a dick. <laughs> yeah. Could you stop yawning? No. He, he can't stop biting you. The same way like shaking hands. Why? You, you, you shook hands like your entire life. Now COVID is a little fist bump, but... So COVID did change a lot. It was hard, yeah? Mm -hmm. Masks, hard. Mm -hmm. Changing behaviors, hard. For him to stop what he's innately doing is almost impossible. Unless we motivate the dog to do it. But if I would punish him for doing something that he can't control, what is that turning you into? A bitch. Okay. So that's the problem. So what we need to do is we need to tell him that if you make a different choice, I'm going to give you the satisfaction that you want. And what is that? Something that she can bite on? Yes. But I can't punish. I can't punish the dog for something that he innately does, or she innately does. Because she doesn't understand it. And what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be a lot of resentment and doubt towards you. What we do need to teach the dog is that biting my arm is no fun. Because I'm not reacting, I'm not doing anything. Because what you do is like, ah, stop it, yeah. And then the dog is like, wow, look at this, like a squeaky toy. You know? <laughs> no, literally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Until the dog now bites hard, and what do you do then? Oh, now you correct her. Does that make sense? So we need to do that a different way. Um, Larry, this one's for you. 
um, when Larry was uh, with me, he was in his 70s, and um, he had a he had an asshole of a dog, powerful. He would come with tears and rips, and the dog would bite him, not just like nibble, bite him. You ever had stitches from your dog? No. That's no, not a bite, then. So, I mean, literally, this a bite. You had that? Okay, and then the dog did not bite. This kind of stuff. Oh, that's just getting older and our skin getting thinner. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, man. Ouch. No, no, but in the dog's perspective, and the reason why I say that, the reason why I make a little bit of fun with that, is because look how thick a dog's skin is. Mm -hmm. And look how, how the canines are in his jaw. What is that? that canine meant to do, rip. to rip and tear. If he wants to bite you and rip and tear, oh my God, he's gonna know it. What he wants to do is invite you to play. The problem is, is our skin compared to dog skin is like paper. Mm -hmm. It's literally paper thin. And then, you know, um, after we reach, you know, 40, 45, you know, our, our skin gets like thinner and thinner and thinner, then we are like 50 and 60. And, you know, and then it gets a little bit thinner and thinner and then we start bruising more and then it hurts more. And then even, even our dogs try to be really gentle, it hurts. Mm -hmm. But in his, in her, her mind, she said, I, I try to be really, really gentle. Because, um, hold that thought. Um, but the, the problem is, is that we are not compatible. Does that make sense? So one of the things that I do, and I did that with Larry, I gave him two sleeves from a dive suit for a surf suit, neoprene. You can bite that motherfucker all day. And you know what happened? He didn't feel anything. There was no boo-boos. There was no bruises. And the dog did what? No more fun. Oh, yes, sir. Really? No more fun. Mom does not squeak anymore. I loved my mom as a squeaky toy. You know, and it would stop. And the problem is, the problem is because they get so much reinforcement of doing that, it now becomes obsessive. And they say, stop! I'm like, okay, mom. And then the dog eventually realizes that after six or seven minutes of squeaking, she turns into a mean, and then she's eventually she's going to like, she's going to bite you for a little bit and then goes away. She comes back and says, I'm going to reset, starts biting a little bit, and then you, ah, wow, stop, 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 stop. And then she, ho, ho, now I'm going to go away. And she comes back to prevent that. Stop! Does that happen? So to the dog, it's all play? Yes! Oh, yeah, just recently, this was new. She was actually coming up behind me and biting. Yeah. yeah which she hadn't done before. You know why? You know what dogs do? Like, I, if I bring my dogs out, we'll, we'll bring my three dogs out, and you'll see my little, I have a, um, a German Shepherd, that's half German Shepherd, a quarter coyote, and a quarter wolf. You'll see a lot of innate play behavior. You know what she does? She bites their ankles, and then says, ee -hee, and then runs away. You do, what do my other dogs do? Chase them. She wants to chase. She wants to herd. A lot of border carls do that, yeah? They're in a group of people, they circle, bite your ankle, ha ha. And then they go to another one, papa, bite your ankle. And then they go, papa, bite your ass. And then, whoa, my God. And then you move. And then they come back and do that again. Then, oh, you move. And you see what they're doing? They're making you move. Mm -hmm. What is a? Hurting. It's a German? Shepherd. Ah, shepherd. And what do shepherds do? Herd. Herd. And how do they hurt the uh, sheep and the goats and the cows? Yeah. They nip in their ankles and their little butts. Mm -hmm. And then you turn into a squeaky dog. Hey, stop! It's like, hee hee! This is fun until you turn into a mean witch. And then she says, okay, time out. And then they, they learn. They learn like every three minutes, every four minutes. If, I'm a little, if I stop a little sooner, I don't have that aversive response. And then I can reset the game. Is that what happens? Interesting. Especially trying to get a collar on. Ooh. Yeah, a little. Just, this arm's 
I'll, I'll, I'll put a collar on for you and show you how to, what to do. Yeah, but please come. Oh, you had a question. I think I forgot it. You forgot it. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, but you see what we can do? We can then start adding stuff depending on what. What dog do I have? But what we do and how we do it is the same. We need to establish good rules communication. We need to uh, establish um, expectation. Let's work. And we need to build that expectation based upon we say and not because of what we have. It is not because I take my leash that we are going for a walk. 99.9% of the people, when they take a leash in their house, you know what happens? The leash ends up on the dog. Not on the husband, not on the wife, not on the kids, on the dog. <laughs> except, except in your family, Gina. <laughs> yeah, but not on the spouse, not on the stuff. But we always take the dog out. Every time we put on our jacket, what do we do? Yeah. We're going to go out. You're not watching TV, you're not making your favorite soup, and you're, you know, you're not going to bed with your jacket on. You should. You see what we're doing? We're creating expectation. You take your car keys, what happens? Start the car. You put your dog in the car. And what, what do you do with your dog when he's in the car? You drive. Read a freaking book. The car expected is the expectation of going. And that is a problem with not most when, with most people. Oh, sorry, I covered my mic, you guys. Is that you know in their daily lives they they have been conditioned to so many expectations that are fulfilled by what you do that they can predict your behavior. And in the games, they cannot. And so stress becomes a very stress, uh, the, the game becomes a very stressful game. Because they know when the doorbell comes, somebody comes in. You know when your phone rings, you always do this and hang up. And you know when the ding from the microwave, they know the door goes open. You know when it's look, 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 look from the ice maker, you know, ice comes out. You know when uh, daddy comes, <laughs> the gate here, my beep of the gates, they know somebody's driving in. You know, when uh, you go in that one cabinet, that there's where the dog cookies are, that's the extra special stuff. Now I'm going to come and sit calmly. When it's the other tub where the kibble's in, I don't really care for that, because I know the tub. Yeah? True business. True business, yeah? And then, oh, I know this basket. Because that's where the balls are in. I like the basket. Because that's where the toys are in. And we have become very predictable. And that's the biggest problem that people have, is they are so predictable. And then the dog begins anticipation. And then anticipation does what? When you take the leash, and it takes you a little bit longer to go to the front door, what does your dog do? Because there's a the frustration because you don't, don't move fast enough. And then you go in the game, and then what happens is, OK, yeah. okay I'm, I'm ready, you, you rush, you got out, and the dog won again. So in 99% of the, the, the people's lives, the, the dog has set rules in your life and then in the game, he doesn't know what to expect. And that's why playing with a dog is often perceived as a very stressful thing. Because the dog doesn't have as much control over you. And, and when he doesn't, he's going to find ways to do that. And then often develops possessiveness over the game or the ball or whatever uh, toy you have. And then, um, you know, the game goes to shit. So playing is not just developing a game. And this is a, probably the most important thing that I'm going to say in this lecture.
playing starts with killing all anticipation in the house. If you want a dog that is going to be focused on you and is going to be calm in whatever he does, you need to stop your routines in the house. You need to start randomly taking the leash and take that leash from one side to the other side of the house. And put on your coat and just sit in your recliner and watch TV. Turn the thermostat down. And then put something in the microwave, let it ding and don't take it out. Let it ding again, just water, ding, 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 and nothing happens. All that stuff. Move your food from one cabinet in the other. Why store it in the same freaking thing? Because we're humans. Uh, Obi probably has a couple holes already in the yard because he said, oh, this, now I'm going to bury my bone on this side of the yard and then I'm going to bury it on that side of the yard and it's not the same hole all the time. So randomize that. Randomize what you do and your dog will be calm. Your alarm when you wake up. Who wakes up with an alarm? Oh, nobody? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you smack it, you snooze it. Okay, so how many on average, how many snoozes do you have? There's no wrong answer. It varies from five to maybe six, maybe sometimes two. Yeah, from two to ten. So after how many snoozes does your dog become a little anxious? Two or three that I start hearing some whining. Mm -hmm. And then when he's it's. Locked, he's locked in the crate. And he's in his crate. And then when it's six, when he's not home. Um, doesn't really seem to bug him too much. He knows when. He probably keeps smacking that thing. Yeah. Before I get up. And I don't always. I try and not always let him out as soon as I get up. I wait. Was that a change or did That's you. That's a change that you taught me. Ah, good. And that helped? Yes. Yeah. Because that wasn't what you normally did, yeah? Yeah, so one of the things that I said is like change your behavior, change your habits. Mm -hmm. You know, people wake up and they, oh, there's the morning piss. Then it's either the coffee or the toothbrush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in random order for s some people. But it's always the same. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they said, oh, an hour for work is great. And they do exactly the same thing. And that's the biggest problem that we have with our dogs is because we do exactly the same thing. And then you probably let him out at the same time or her at the same time. And then when they're out, you're probably doing the same thing. As soon as they're up, they need to go pee-pees. And then if you don't let them go pee-pees, they go nuts. Or they pee-pee in the house because now they're mad at you that you actually didn't let them out. It's not because they need to go pee-pees. It's because they give you the middle finger. They're not doing what you're doing. What I do here is I randomize my dogs. Not every dog gets out at the same time. The order is different. Uh, because, you know, I, 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 I have 13 dogs here that I need to take care of. And then sometimes I say, well, you need to wait a little bit. And then, well, you get trained, you don't get trained. You don't get trained, you don't get food. And then you get breakfast at 2 in the afternoon. And then, yeah, you get dinner at 1 in the afternoon because you had breakfast at 4 in the, after uh, four in the morning. And so I randomize. My dogs do not know when they get fed, when they work, when they play, what they do. And so what does that create? Zero expectation. And zero anticipation is to do what? Eliminate frustration. Yeah, eliminates frustration. And eliminates frustration, you know what that does? Makes me sleep without earplugs. No whining, no barking, just basically waiting. Because I change my stuff all the time. The other that thing that I do not allow my dogs to do is to have toys. Zero toys in the house. I control the game. I will tell you when to play. You don't tell me anything. I will tell you when it's feeding time. Your survival depends on me and your fun depends on me. 
If you're not calm, you're not doing shit. But I'm going to organize my environment, and that's why I say, say all the time, we need to set our dogs up for success. We need to create that environment where that is possible. We need to make sure that we don't give the dog access to the toys. We need to make sure that we randomize our house. We need to make sure that we not st store the cookies in always the same uh, cabinets, that we um, you know, sometimes just take the leash and uh, say, hey, mate, you want to go for a walk? Instead of our dog. Yeah, that we don't do everything uh, the same thing, that we, you know, take on our coats, that we start the car, that we put the dog in the car, that we read a book, feed the dog in the car by hand, and then go back. Let the dog sleep in the car, and then go back. Sometimes I do this, yeah, yep, you sleep in that crate, you sleep in the car, you can sleep on my bed tonight, and then I'll change it up, and then you sleep in the car, and cars for sleeping, for eating, for waiting, for when clients come, they see Mike sometimes puts his dog in my car or then puts his dog in his car or then puts his dog in the van that we have and then puts the dog in the trailer and, you know, or, or sometimes you wait in the kennel. You don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what to do. And the dog says, okay, hey, Dad, where am I going? And I was done. And that creates what? Zero expectation, zero anticipation, zero frustration, calm dog, calm mind. And what does the dog need to pay attention to? You. Only you. What does he need to worry about in his life? You. Only you. And then on top of that, you know, when, I, when I'm really good with my socialization, I don't let my dog play with other dogs. Why? Because my, my dogs are much better in playing with other dogs than with me. So don't play with other dogs, please. I don't want you to get addicted to playing better than I can play. Yeah? Just learn to play with me. And when you're addicted to that, then and only then I'm going to let you play with a dog. That's kind of a bonus. What people do is they let the dogs play with other dogs, and now the dogs are addicted with playing with their own species, and then they want to expect the dogs to have fun with you. It's not going to happen. You're not a dog. Um, so all that stuff, that's why I'm saying, you know, the, the, the most important part of this lecture is that playing starts with changing your behavior in the house by getting rid of a lot of expectations and anticipations and turn the focus to you. It goes hand in hand with hand feeding. It goes hand in hand with consistency and clarity in communication. It goes hand in hand with, again, with trying to get rid of all the previous conditioned, classical conditioned stuff. You know, the, the beeper of the gate doesn't mean that somebody comes in. The knock on the door doesn't mean that somebody comes in. The doorbell doesn't mean that somebody comes in. All that stuff, my phone sometimes rings and I'll let it go. You know, I, I set a trick with the microwave. Sometimes I put a cup of water in there and I just, ding, start it again during my day. Ding, that doesn't mean that it goes open. Yeah, all that good stuff. Yeah, and then once you do that correctly and you have the right mind, then you can start figuring out, you know what, well, maybe, maybe my dog does enjoy tugging a little bit more than chasing. Well, then incorporate more tugging into your game. Maybe my dog starts, you know, likes retrieving more in my game. Well, then start incorporating that a little bit more. Maybe my dog starts, you know, uh, he likes finding something. Well, m maybe start implementing more seek games, hide games in your two ball. And then, you know, implement what makes your dog tick today. Yeah, and I always say, what's the motivation today? Today it might be chasing, tomorrow it might be biting, tomorrow it might be finding. We don't know, but we need to look what dog we have today. That's the different dog than it was yesterday, and it's going to be a different dog that is tomorrow. Yeah, we don't eat potatoes. Yeah, some people do eat potatoes every day, but, you know, I, I don't like to do the same thing every day, too. Dogs are the similar way. So we need to figure out what motivates my dog today. Sometimes what I do is I grab a tug toy, I grab a ball, and I grab food, and I go to my dog, what are we doing today, buddy? I want to chow today. Okay, we're gonna work, we're gonna play with food then. It's nice, funny. 
Well, it means click. Yeah. But how? If we click, what do we do? Feed by hand. Yeah, we feed by hand. What if I say yes? Forward. Yeah. Or a tug toy. Mm -hmm. Or a sock. Or a piece of sausage. And I can play with food in my garage a little bit. You see? And I have a tuck toy, I have a sock. I say, what do you want to play with? What motivates you today? I have a lecture on Facebook. It's in my Facebook group. You are not in control of what motivates your dog. If you haven't watched that our video, watch it. You are not controlling what motivates your dog. Your dog controls what motivates him. Whether it's food, ball, chase, whatever it is. The art in our interaction is that we figure that one out. That we can see that we can see what makes our dog stick. And that we vary that. And that we then vary the intensity, that we vary the duration, and that we become as addicting as a slot machine in Vegas. Because if we play always the same game, if we always have the same 10 throws, if we always uh, let him bite after two, three throws, if we all, always play for 30 seconds tug, I always tell, then you're a communist. Be a capitalist. Make your dogs guess how long you're going to play, how far you're going to throw, how many times you're going to throw, and all that stuff. How much food is it going to get? Is it click one kibble or click ten kibbles or click for eat for 30 freaking seconds? Hmm. That depends on you. And that's where the, the, um, the human adds value to the click, adds value to the interaction that he has with the food. The reason why hand feet is not is that you add value to the food, that it's not so much about the food, that it's, you know, learning how to communicate. Hey, you can follow me, you can chase me, you can, I can make you spin, I can do all kinds of different stuff. And we need to learn that first before we can play. Yeah? Uh, do you click before you feed? Yes, sir. Click food. Click food. Click food. Click food. So clicker also means come get your food? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah. The dog's like right there and he looks at me. I click. Come to me. And so what's the work that he needs to do? Come to me. The reason why I always walk backwards is why? In order to get what you want is what do you want to do? Come, come to me. And if you want to come play with me again, what do you need to do? Click come to you. If I want to play with the ball, let's come to you. If you want to eat, what you need to do is come to me. What's the one behavior people have always trouble with? Recalls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But do my dogs learn from the gecko as a puppy? In order to get what I want, what do I need to do? Go to the owner. I never have a problem with recalls in my entire life. I never have a problem with dogs staying with me. I never train my dogs on a collar or on a leash. Why? Because in everything they want in their life is what they do. What do they need to do? Come to you. Come to me. So, if they keep the ball here, what am I doing? Would I go to them or would I walk away? Would I try to get the ball or would I walk away? Walk away. Please. Yes. I don't give a shit that you have this ball. Destroy it. Eat it. Choke on it. I don't care. I'm walking away. I'm gonna play with my ball. There you go. You want to play? You want to play to me? Let Obi just do what he does. And that is what's important. And now the dog's going to say, like, hey, wait a minute. There is a big contrast in the fun between when I interact with my guy or when I interact by myself. And by myself, it's not that fun. And now the, the, the dog is slowly but surely going to figure out that, hey, wait a minute. Every time I re-engage, it is more fun. Does that make sense? So playing is not that simple. If we have a dog, for instance, that when we see that he's obsessed, like uh, some pit bulls, obsessed by, by holding the tug, would you play tug with him? No, because you can't, 
you can't be as um, satisfying as the innate drivers. So don't even bring it up. Don't do it. Don't play tug. Yeah. Me. Any questions? Um, the, the randomness makes sense. Randomness makes yeah, sense. To decrease anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to get rid of predictability. But it sounds like there are situations where you need to be consistent in your what you're communicating. Yes. For example, two ball. Yes. You know, to create the predictability then creates trust. Yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bonus. This lecture was about playing, but I'm going to give you a little bonus here. I'm going to answer that, answer that question here with a little bonus. It is a separate lecture, but I'll give a little intro. Eventually, what we do with our dogs is we learn to communicate. And I, what I just said is that we need to get rid of all predictability. However, I also want to create a lot of predictability. I want to create a lot of anticipation. I need to get rid of, I would say, classical conditions anticipation. In my video from Tyrant to Teacher, I say we need to keep Pavlov as small as possible and get Skinner as high as possible. So all operant conditions behavior, uh, we need to try to, to increase and all classical conditions responses, we need to be as small as possible. However, there are expectations, uh, exceptions, yeah? So, let's potty. Every time I use that, what is the expectation of my dog? Go to the bathroom. Every time I take my dogs to go potty, before they go potty, I say, let's potty. Yeah? You want to go bye-bye? Every time I say that, my car moves. That doesn't mean you're getting out of the car. That means that you're in the car, but we're going to go for a ride. Yeah? Let's work. That means work. Food. Balls etc. You want to get the motherfucker? That's a cue for my dogs. You want to get the motherfucker? That means we're going to do protection. We're going to bite somebody. Yeah? <laughs> Every time I train for, for protection, that's what I use, protection. So now we're in the car, and I see Mr. Homeless, and I say, hey, you want to get the motherfucker? Guess what happens in my car? <laughs> yeah? Because it's conditioned. Every time I said that, they did protection. Yeah? If I say slopping, that means sleep. Okay. Does that mean at night? Because people, no, that means now. If they go out, say slop. Go in the creek, go slop. Dogs sleep randomly. Yeah? They need 17 hours of sleep a day, minimum. That's why she's wound up. That's why she's so active. Yeah. We have a crate right in the family room where we are. Not good. Yeah, yeah. So that's another lecture. But yeah, so I pre-cue everything. Everything that I do, what I'm going to do with the dog, I'm going to tell him. And I'm going to I'm be very consistent. So it starts with a click. And then I say, you know, let's work. And then click. 
and I say game over or all done. And every time I'm all done, what means the activity that we're in is over. And so that way I'm very predictable. Everything I do. However, everything I do in my house is not predictable. My food's not stored at the right in the same time. My dogs don't eat at the same time. My dogs don't go to bed at the same time. My leashes are not the same time. Sometimes like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll watch TV with my training vest on because my training vest doesn't mean we're gonna work. My coat doesn't mean we're gonna go outside. When I put on my shoes, that doesn't mean that I'm going outside. Um, all that stuff, my car doesn't mean that I'm actually going for a ride. We can either sit there and all that stuff. That's part of my training. Yeah, so there, when, I, when, I, when people think of training, they think about sits, down, stands, etc. Training is living with a dog. That's why I, I call this a relationship-based, um, my system is relationship-based because m most of the time we're just living with our dogs. We're not on a, on a, on a, in our garage trying to sit down and stand. And so in order for us to calm our dog down, where does the behavior change? With us. We're making the decision to store our food in a different container. We're making the decision to sit on the couch with our vest. We're making the decision to not drive the car. We're making the decision to take the leash and you know, walk, walk the leash around at the house. That's us. We make that behavioral change, not the dog. And that's why I said 80% of your dog's problems is, comes from you because we are so focused on external behavior, on sit down, stand and heal. That's what we want and recalls. We focus all our time on this, but it doesn't solve our life with our dogs. Yeah, because the reason why we have our dogs is to, to live together and to be companions and to have a lot of fun together. But that training starts with us. We need to, we need to change our behavior. We need to manage the dog's environment for him to be able to be successful. And that's why I have these lectures. And that's why I say theory is more important than working with the dog, because you learn a lot more. Like now you go home and you start implementing all these changes, half of your problems are solved, seriously. But it's doing that consistently. It's like not for a week. Because then you put, uh, you finally did this every day, and now that same jar is there for a month or two. What did you just do? I start all over again. You see? It doesn't mean need to, it needs to be half an hour. It's just like, take your leash, just put somewhere. There you go. This is what I use for detection work, put drugs in it and all that stuff. And it's not because it's here that I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna hide it. It's not that it's here that's accessible, all that stuff, yeah? So we need to do that. So I hope today um, the, the lecture here, um, should we play tug with the dog and, and then um, how, how should we play with the dog, um, gave a little bit of uh, insight in how complex uh, playing is and what a powerful tool it uh, can be. So I'll give uh, everybody the opportunity here to um, ask some questions and to give some feedback on the lecture. Let me start with you, sir. Can you grab the camera for me? Any questions, anything you want to add? <clears throat> well, on the <clears throat> tug of war, you know, sometimes, you know, the confusion, you have to show I'm the dominant person, so you're not going to overpower me. That is not true. The dog should always overpower you in order to have a calm dog. <clears throat> so you always let the dog win. I always let the dog win, and I'll show you how to play tug of war. Tug of war is an art. It's very, very difficult. It's not like that. It's very, very difficult. I'll, I'll show you. I'll, I'll literally give you a demo, how to play tug. We'll go to the field and I'll give you a demo. Yeah, but it's something that we need to learn. The problem is people, when they talk about tug of war and games, is it's, I need to be the boss. I need to be the winner. I need to be the ego. That's, you know, I am the tyrant. And that's where I say teachers. In games, the dog always, 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 always wins. You always loses. Because the dog needs fun. And in, the do in, the, in order for the dog to win again, what does he need to do? Re-engage with you. That doesn't mean your dominance. 
yeah? Playing is not a dominant game. Playing is an interaction between an, art, an, an object and you and the dog. And it's got nothing to do with dominance. When dominance becomes a part of the game, we're going to introduce problems. Because now the dog has a reason to start ranking you because you show dominance. And if the dog doesn't accept that dominance, now he's going to start fighting you and ranking you. And now we're not playing anymore, now we're ranking. And that the, the, the ranking problem that we have in tug of war is initiated by the human because we have initially said that we want to have this as a ranking game rather than as a fun interaction. And that is where the difficulty lies in playing tug of war. Yeah? Ma'am. Um, a big problem I'm having with our dog, and I know she thinks it's probably play, and it was bad, and then it got better, and now it's really bad again. I'll sit down on the couch, and she'll just come flying up on me, onto my head, start yanking at my hair, biting my head, biting my ears. She immediately goes into crate. Okay. And then five seconds, and she's out. Okay. And then she does that again. She immediately goes into crate. Five seconds later, she's out. She does that again, immediately goes back in the crate. Five seconds later, she's out. Do not let your dog more than five or ten seconds in that crate because she's not going to learn it. You're going to do this probably 200 to 300 times that evening, and it's solved. But you don't stop. Every time she does that, she goes into the crate. You don't say no. You don't talk to your dog. You don't do anything. You grab the dog by the collar. She goes in the crate. You sit on the couch, you go back into the, into the crate, you open the crate, you sit back on the couch, she does that again, you don't see anything, you grab the dog, you put it in the crate, and etc. and cetera. You do that a hundred times, solved. Well, when, the, I, when she does it, it's like you're reading on the couch. She'll come up behind on the couch, the paws come over you like a hug, and then she goes after her, her fur. Yeah, done. Is, I mean, is she playing? Or no, she she's dominating, dominating you. She's dominating. Probably. Mm -hmm. Playing, dominate, ranking. Mm -hmm. I would say ranking. Okay. Yeah, she's, she's young, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you see it as bad. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. It's normal. You created that behavior. Because you, you interacted when she did that. You made noise. You were turned into a squeaky toy. So, I mean, I, I sound like a dick. You know, and that's where I'm not, I'm not a trainer. I, 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 I will never correct that behavior. I will never see that as faulty behavior. A dog biting me is not faulty behavior. It's behavior that you don't want, mm -hmm. but it's not faulty canine behavior. It's very natural for him to do that. The problem is it's not compatible with what we want. Does that make sense? Yeah. So once we, and this is where, you know, when you look at my pyramid, the first thing is attitude. And that's the hardest thing for us to grasp. If like, we want to be a really good become with dogs, we need to change our attitude a little bit. We need to stop being thinking like the dominant one, thinking, with, thinking like the alpha, thinking like, oh my God, uh, my dog just pulled on my hair, that's, that's bad. Mm -hmm. That's totally normal. You see dogs pull each other's fur all the time? Right, right. That's what she does. You, you have 10 dogs in your house? Do I have ten? Yeah. No, one. One. No, you have three. Oh. One, two, gotcha. three. Okay. So she sees, she interacts with you as a dog. And that is not compatible with how we interact as a human. Mm -hmm. But the behavior displayed is not bad. It's not like, oh my God, like we, we as humans try to immediately punish natural stuff. But the problem is, is because we have reinforced it. The reason why dogs do, thing, the, do the things they like to do is because it's reinforcing for them. If dogs do things for two reasons, it's to survive and to better their situations at all times. And behavior that is displayed is displayed because it's motivating for them. The behavior that is displayed is because it's reinforcing for them. And so the question that we as humans need to ask ourselves is what do we do to make that reinforcing? Squeaking like a squeaky toy is one of them. Yeah? And so, and then if we then turn into the bad wolf, we turn into the mean man, then the dog does not understand that because we have been reinforcing that behavior for such a long time. So the, the key 
in changing that stuff, is, is changing our attitude in how we look at that behavior. Because there's no such thing as bad dog behavior. Because it's behavior that the dog does naturally. It's not compatible with what we want. That is the problem. And so the art in, in, in behavior modification, when people see me with my dogs, they always want that. It's just like, oh my God, like, like it's your dogs can read your minds. So yeah, they can. But it took a long time to get there. I had bruises, I have, you know, scars, I've been like, uh, it's not always easy, you know, it's, uh, when, I, when I say people, you know, you want, the, what I have with my dogs is the most difficult thing you ever do with your life, because we need to change our attitude and to do that. All that attitude, training, knowledge, equipment, experience has got nothing to do with the dog. I wrote that down for the people is we need to change our attitude, we need to train ourselves, we need to train our knowledge, we need to gain knowledge so we can do it, we need to be sure that we're handling equipment right, and then eventually experience comes and then it will become a, an, automat, uh, an automatic thing that we do. That has got nothing to do with the dog. Like my relationship-based pyramid, it's, it's all about refocusing the mind of the human, and that's where you know, learning how to play comes in. And that is re how to redirect this behavior. Yeah, it's very annoying. I wouldn't like it either. It's very frustrating. Can you imagine, like, oh fucking dog yanking on your head all the time? Like, it's, 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 it's annoying. And it should not happen. Mm -hmm. We should not accept that. Right. But the accept, accepting part is not so much to think at this as this is bad. It is a nat natural. It's a natural occurring behavior. The thing that we need to do is we need to teach the dog that that behavior is less reinforcing than coming up with an alternative. What, what do you mean exactly? About well, if you do another behavior, it's going to be more reinforcing. Like, for instance, sitting in her feet mm -hmm. or laying down next to you on the couch. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh. And now, if I lay next to you, I can destroy A, B, C. I can chew on a Kong that is stuffed with something or whatever it is. But then we slowly but surely start redirecting it. Or we do it negative. And that's what I suggest in this one. There's a, by putting her in the crate. Yeah, there's a bad consequence to this behavior. So do you like to be out of the crate or in the crate? I like to be out of the crate. Well, if you do that behavior, you're going to go in the crate. Dogs learn are very bad generalizers. They need a lot of repetition. So putting her in the crate for an hour is not gonna solve anything. If you ever punish a dog in the crate with a timeout, I love timeouts. It is perfect. Use it all the time. Timeout is five seconds. And then let him do that behavior again. On the counter two, timeout, poop. On the counter, up five seconds later, do that again. Do it again, do it again, do it. Do it 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 1,000 times. That's how the dog learns. Or you yell and beat it, and now she stops because she's afraid of you. Not because she's associating that behavior with something that she shouldn't do. But she's avoiding it because of a consequence that you are going to do that, and that's very detrimental for your relationship. Why the hell would she come to you? Why the hell would she protect you if her life is in danger? She said, I'm out of here. Yeah, does that make sense? So that's why we should spend the time and we can put a dog in a, in a crate a hundred times within the hour, you know, it's fucking easy. So there's 60 seconds in a minute, every five seconds she goes in, well, we've got a, quite a lot of repetitions in that hour. And then the dog is like, wait a minute, I'm going to try something different. I'm not going to pull out of the hair. Oh, I'm still out, I'm still out of the crate. And on top of that, I'm getting pets, and I get something awesome to chew. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You see how we need to change our attitude sometimes? But it's annoying. I, I completely agree. Should we accept it? No. But what I would like you to do is think about, is change our mindset how we are going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. We need to motivate the dog to do something different. Can we punish it? Yes. I'm not a positive trainer. I hate positive trainers because you, you, can't, you can't reward everything. Sometimes there is an aversive consequence and that aversive consequence is me walking away from the ball, me withholding food, me stop playing, me putting you in a box. 
There's no need for beatings. Yeah? Does that make sense? Good. Um, May, any, any, uh, Ken? I can just give an example of the problem I was having. And that was a dog was always jumping on me. I'm sitting down, I'd stand up. He'd quit, I'd stand and jump, I'd stand up. As long as he knew that this wasn't gonna get what he wanted, and what he wanted was me, I'd sit right back down. But jump, he doesn't jump me. Sweet. Right. Yeah, that's the problem with dogs. Once we as humans vocalize, we reinforce. Yeah. So the pro, the the, the, the yeah. <laughs> the, the key, the key is, the key is to learn to shut up. Yeah. We don't like that one. Okay. It worked for me. Yeah. Sir, any questions? Anything you want to add? I'm good right now. Yeah. What did you think of the lecture? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Good. You know, I know I'll, you taught us a lot of this stuff, and we start doing it, and then you kind of slack. We get complacent, you get and, complacent yeah. and we forget. So yeah, I might have to put a, like a board up and reminders, like to no, do all this. No, seriously. Stuff, yeah, I really and that was that, that's what helps. So like, put a little whiteboard. You know, mm -hmm. to every we walk onto the, the the rules of engagement with my pooch, mm -hmm. and every time we walk past that board, we kind of got remembrance. It's like tip of the day, do something. Mm -hmm. exactly. Like don't change everything in one day, but there's write your tip, and it's a good reminder. Yeah, yeah? that's how we learn. Uh, Gina, anything you want to add, share? No, just awesome as always. Good. <laughs> you you want to say something? Say hi, Facebook. <laughs> Want to say hi to Facebook? Say hi, Facebook. Okay. Hey, y'all, anything that you want to share? I'm good. Okay. I didn't realize how uh, much better it was hurting. Mm -hmm. So, um, people uh, online, if you have any more questions, um, I will be here for another minute or so. Then um, I'm asking y'all to see if there's any more comments, any more questions that we can uh, share or answer. Mm -hmm. Another excellent lecture. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for the good uh, compliments. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, today's lecture. Um, so I think the next one is next week on a Sunday. Um, so, you know, guys on Facebook, thank you for being here and for watching, for your support. Um, if there's more questions about this topic, please post them in the, on, on, under the video. Uh, this will be live, then everything is kind of categorized and it helps people um, to read uh, everybody's questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next uh, session. Bye.